Happy Halloween, folks, and welcome to my Friday Night Smackdown review for October 30th, 2020. I am Graham G. S. Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and enjoying your holiday, regardless of how you're spending it. Uh, we had a very good episode of Smackdown once again on Friday, I thought, which, again, is crazy to me, considering that these shows, Raw and Smackdown, are apparently written by the same people. Now, I did see a, a very brief report this morning. Um, I'm not sure how accurate this is. or I, I didn't even click on the link. I just saw it on Twitter, and it seemed to be a pretty credible source that was reporting that Triple H was actually in charge of SmackDown last night after Vince McMahon, or Bruce Pritchard, rather, not Vince. Maybe Vince wasn't there either, but Bruce wasn't there. So Triple H took charge of the show, which apparently is why the show, per Brian Alvarez of the Wrestling Observer radio show, was not finished being written until like an hour beforehand, literally until like 7 or 7, 10 o'clock. Uh, 7 o'clock last night, 7, 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You know, mere minutes, really, before they went live on the air. So that's not good. But usually when you read those type of reports, and I have in the past from SmackDown, it usually equates to a bad show. Especially with Raw, it's not always the greatest. Um, but last night's show, even though it was probably put together at the last minute, I thought was quite good. Now, not everything on SmackDown right now is lighting the world on fire. I don't want to make it sound like SmackDown is this amazing show. But to be fair, though, to be fair, SmackDown, even back in 02 through 05, its glory days, so to speak, was still, while great, had a lot of things that, you know, people didn't give a fuck about. Like, I guess people cared about the Tory wilson Don Marie feud. Personally, I thought it was trash, but that's just me. Not everything on SmackDown was perfect back then, either. The roster was great, a lot of the matches were great, and some of the top storylines were also very, very good. I feel like that's the case currently with SmackDown. Not every storyline is great. I fucking hate the whole Rollins, Murphy, Mysterio family bullshit drama. I hate it all. Um, but the rest of the show I thought was quite good. Now, we are headed into Survivor Series season, so if you don't care about the qualifying matches and brand supremacy, which, to be fair, let's be honest here, as most of us, then you probably didn't care a whole lot about this show. But I thought the matches themselves were actually quite good. So we kicked off the show before any of the brand supremacy stuff started. We got into the Roman reigns Jey Uso angle. Because at Hell in the Cell, let's not forget, Roman Reigns beat Jey Uso. And by virtue of that victory, Roman Reigns is now in charge, I guess, of Jey Uso. He's now head of the table, blah, blah, blah. I don't really care about the whole head of the table stuff just because that doesn't really it really mean anything for viewers. But Jey having to follow Roman is absolutely intriguing. That's very intriguing to me. Now, we said Jimmy last week as well. They did recap that you know, at the start of the show here on SmackDown. We didn't see Jimmy here. We only saw Jey. Um, I don't know if Jimmy's clear to compete yet. You know, he got physical on Sunday, so if not now, then probably soon. But Jimmy was not present on SmackDown last night. Instead, it was just Jay. And they had a great back and forth. Roman basically said, you got to do what you're told. Like, I'm your tribal chief now, blah, blah, blah. And Jay was very hesitant. He cried. He said, I hate you, all this other stuff. Just a really, really good emotional opening segment to kind of plant the seeds for what we would see after the main event between Jay Uso and Daniel Bryan. They had a match to uh, determine who would qualify for Team SmackDown at Survivor Series. So, yeah, I mean, we'll get to that later, but I thought this was a great way to kick off the show. The Roman and Jey Uso storyline, much to everyone's surprise, continues to be the best thing in WWE right now. And there's some good stuff going on right now, but this is easily the strongest storyline that any brand has going on right now, maybe even including NXT. I fucking love this whole Jey Uso-Roman Reigns stuff, and I love the fact that Roman is now supposed to be leading the Usos which is what I've been wanting to see and a lot of other people have been wanting to see for a very long time now. We got our first taste of in-ring action with Kevin Owens stuck on Dolph Ziggler and a qualifier for the men's SmackDown Survivor Series team. In what was a good match, Owens and Ziggler have had so many matches over the years from literally 2015 up until present day that this was nothing new, but they've always worked well together, so I can't complain. Owens has almost always come out on top, as he should, because Ziggler at this point, who cares? Um, but this was a very good match. Owens went over. Robert Roode got ejected from ringside at one point. Uh, with Ziggler being a tag team guy, you had to know that Owens was going over. I know Ziggler has good Survivor Series, you know, Soul Survivor, you know, uh, history. I'm pretty sure he was a Soul Survivor in 09, not 09, but definitely 2011 and 2012. So he had good, you know, and in 2014 as well, he actually has really good Survivor Series history. Not sure how it's how strong it's been since then, and that was six years ago. But I like the, you know, I like the fact that he had a chance to qualify. He failed, so we move on to Kevin Owens instead, as they should. I thought he was the uh, right fit for Team SmackDown at Survivor Series. So good match there. 
We had a sit-down interview with Lars Sullivan being interviewed by Corey Graves. Now, I didn't see a lot of people talking about this, and maybe that's a good thing. Usually when people are talking about it, it, it's either really, really good or really, really bad. And I absolutely expected this to be the latter. Um, and listen, I, I'm one of the few people who still likes Lars. He obviously has a lot of issues. As an on-air performer, as an in-ring performer, character, whatever, I'm still, you know, I'm still, you know, in favor of him. Not him getting, oh, let's put the fucking title on him right now, but I'm interested to see what he'll bring to the table. The matches so far have been good. He's an agile athlete. He's a big guy. He can move around for a guy of his size, which is cool. He reminds me a lot of Braun, and I'm not the biggest Braun Strowman fan, but largely that's because of bad booking and bad creative that's really ruined his character. Lars never really had a chance to get ruined because he hasn't really been around at all, and he might end up being the next Braun Strowman. But so far, so good. They've kept him undefeated. He's beaten Jeff Hardy, among other people. So he had a sit-down interview here, and I thought this was really good. Just because they kind of gave people, if you want to give a shit about him, which apparently, you know, I, I understand why, but a lot of people don't, but they gave you a reason to want to care about this guy. He explained the freak nickname, and he was like, oh, the first time I heard the freak nickname, and I thought he was going to say, oh, on SmackDown last year, or an NXT, whatever. But no, they go back to his childhood. He basically told a little mini story saying that, you know, all the kids used to call him a freak, even the teacher, I guess, and he used to call him a freak, and they would laugh at him, point fingers at him, blah, blah, blah. But they weren't all laughing 20 minutes later, and he was never welcome. And they weren't crying, in fact. They were crying, or more so screaming, he said. And he was never welcome back in his school. Now, what exactly he did, I have no idea. He did not specify. That's left to our imagination. Um, I mean, if this was 2020, that could mean a variety of things, and that's kind of scary. But I'm assuming he means 20, 30 years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago. Um, he, he probably just beat him up, hopefully. Fingers crossed. But anyway, that was the origin of his freak nickname. And he basically said, of course he doesn't like being called a freak. It's not something he enjoys. But he's on SmackDown to wreak havoc and make this brand his own personal hell on earth. Those were his words. I thought this was good. Again, I really wish we would get more of this type of stuff with the stars of SmackDown and Raw and NXT. And we get it sometimes. And the video packages help. They did a video package on Lars last week right before he beat Chad Gable, who was not on this show, by the way, and that was kind of disappointing. Um, after the whole Chad Gable reveal last week, he wasn't even on the show this week. It's not even like, I know when people can't be on the show every week, but at least say, like, oh, he'll be around next week or something like that. You know what I mean? The Otis thing, too, like, Otis got turned on by Tucker. That sounds weird. Otis turned on, uh, Tucker turned on Otis, rather, at Hell in the Cell on Sunday. They offered zero follow-up on Raw the brand that Tucker's supposed to be a part of. Instead, he was on fucking main event this week, losing Humberto Carrillo. And the notice was nowhere to be seen on SmackDown. Apparently, that storyline is not a priority to WWE. Because otherwise, why wouldn't they have followed up that angle? Not that a lot of people care anyway, but it's a pretty big development when a tag team partner turns on another and causes him to lose the Money in the Bank briefcase. Zero follow-up. Whatever. Maybe next week. But I thought this was good, though. Back to the Lars sit-down, you know, Sullivan sit-down uh, interview here. I thought this was good, and I think more people can benefit from having this type of treatment. Like a, like a Chad Gable, for example. Chad Gable was on the After the Bell podcast this week. I saw a few clips with Corey Graves and Chad Gable on the WWE YouTube channel, and it was really, really good. He comes across as a great guy, and I, I think we all kind of figured that. Um, but we need to hear his story on SmackDown. He can change the name to whatever he wants, Shorty G... Shorty Gable, Chad Gable, whatever. Um, it doesn't really matter. You know, Chad, the, the, the Gable guy, whatever. But it, it's not going to make a difference unless they give people a reason to care about this guy. And I think this type of treatment would help a lot. We got another qualifying match for Survivor Series. This one being for the women's team to represent the blue, band, uh, to represent the blue brand at the event. It was a triple threat match between Bianca Belair, Billy Kay, and Natalia. Of course, Billy Kay... Taking the fall here to Bianca Belair. Good match. The match was, you know, whatever. Nothing really special. But Bianca Belair was, of course, the right call to advance to the team at Survivor Series. Billy Kay's a loser. And Natalia, just, don't even get me started on Natalia. I had this great, not debate, but like this back and forth with a few people on Twitter last night about Natalia doesn't really stand out. You know, she bores people to tears, including myself. Because I think she is the definition of overrated. I will not say that about a lot of people. I think a lot of people are either right where they should be or underrated. 
she is absolutely underrated, or, or overrated rather, absolutely overrated. She is a woman that because she is Jim Neidhart's daughter, that we all think she's amazing. And that's not always the case. I mean, just because you're a you know, second generational talent, I mean, look no further than fucking Lacey Von Erich, who is completely terrible. I'm not saying Natalia is terrible. She's actually quite good. The thing with Natalia, though, is that she came up at a time where she was the best of a division that sucked. She debuted in 2008. So, of course, we're going to look at her as being like the savior. That's like if Eve Torres was around today. Now, Eve Torres did improve. Even AJ Lee, she improved too. She was great. And we thought she was the best of that division. You put her in with the women of today, I don't think she does as well. She has a great character. In ring-wise, she was not the greatest. A even AJ Lee, I could see the argument being made for her being overrated. But the thing with AJ Lee is that we haven't really seen her mix it up because she left five years ago. We never really got a chance to see her mix it up with the Sasha Bankses and the Baileys and the Charlottes and the Becky Lynches. She did have a one-off match with Bailey back in 2013 on an episode of NXT. I think for the Divas Championship, actually. But other than that, she never really mixed it up with the women of today. She did with Paige, and the matches were underwhelming. So, I mean, that might be a prime example right there as to how overrated she might be. But Natalia, we have seen, mix it up with all those women I just mentioned. And she's had good matches with all of them. But Natalia, I feel, really peaked at that takeover in, in 2014, that first takeover. Not, not a rival, but the, the first actual takeover with Charlotte. They had an amazing match with the NXT Women's Championship. And again... It's a great match, but it's not the greatest women's match of all time. The reason it was so great was because we hadn't really seen many matches like that up to that point. But we've seen so many, so many better matches since then, that the match kind of pales in comparison now. It's like Trish and Lita. It's the exact same thing. They had a lot of good matches throughout 2004, 2005, 2003, 2006. But the thing is, the matches weren't that good compared to what we're getting today. For the time, it was great. For 2008, Natalia was great. But she's been around for so fucking long that she is so stale by this point, and it's just hard to care. I know I went off in a mini tangent, not really a mini tangent, but uh, quite the tangent there on Natalia, but it's worth mentioning just because, not that, that she doesn't have anything of value, like I really think behind the scenes she either is or can help that younger talent, help elevate them, work behind the scenes like her husband, Tyson Kidd, but as an on-air performer, with as much television time as this woman gets, you think she would be more, at least a little more compelling than she is, but she hasn't been interesting in at least five to six years, probably longer than that, probably since the NXT stuff with Charlotte, to be honest with you. She's just kind of bland compared to everyone. As a character, she sucks. There's zero debate about that. In the ring, she's good, but I can name at least five to six women that are better, at least, if not more. So, anyway, that's my mini rant on Natalia. But this was fine. Bianca Belair winning was the right call. So, this is when things really went to shit. Now, the show was good. This was easily the worst part of the show. So, we had Murphy come out. Right before this, Murphy was backstage with Aaliyah. Aaliyah Mysterio, of course. And Aaliyah was talking about how, oh, you know, my mom is very open-minded. She's very supportive. My dad and my brother, not so much. They don't like you very much. Despite what I tell them about you, they don't like you. And she's giving off very in love vibes here. So I'm thinking, okay, this is weird. Why else would she be talking to Ray and Dominic about Murphy unless she was in a relationship with them? And I'm like, okay, this is exactly where I did not want this storyline to go. And Murphy is like, oh, maybe I'll try to win them over by apologizing right now in the ring. And she's like, do you really want to do this? And he said, I do. It's something I need to do. Or blah, blah, blah. Some, it, it, it was, this was awful. So they go outside, or they go out to the ring, and he attempts to apologize before being interrupted by none other than Seth fucking Rollins, who has literally nothing better to do than continue to be involved in this stupid storyline. At the very least, they can move Rollins right out of this shit. Because Rollins beat Murphy last week, a match they should have saved for Hell in the Cell. They did it on SmackDown, it was a great match. Rollins won. Why else would he care about this feud, storyline, whatever? Who cares. This feud with Rollins and the Mysterios and now Murphy has been going on since almost May. Almost six months and has been going on since May. We are a day away from November. That is how long this feud has been going on for. It needs to fucking end. It should have ended months ago, but now that they're on SmackDown, we need to see these guys and girls, I guess girl, Aaliyah, go in different directions. Aaliyah needs to go in a different direction off the show. She has no business being around. Yeah, she's 19... Whatever. Her acting is not awful. There is zero reason 
to have her be a part of this. There, there is no reason for her to have a presence on the show. She really brings nothing of value for the initial dom for the initial Dominic stuff, where like she was there to be supportive with her family and all this other shit. All right, fine. But now that Dominic's a loser and has lost literally every time he's ever faced Seth Rollins, then why is she still here? Because she's in love, she said, with Murphy. That's what she told her dad and Dominic. She is in love with the former buddy Murphy. And they're no longer buddies. They're a little more than buddies. And I could tell that because they then kissed. They then kissed here on the show. Now, I've made it quite clear. I think the storyline sucks anyway, for a variety of reasons. One, it's played out. That's probably the least of them, which is surprising, I know, but it's been played out. There's no reason to really continue this feud. They've been bra- they've been dragging it. It's not like it just started and it sucks. It's been going on for six months now, and it was good at certain points, but at this point, I just don't care. So, they've been doing this now for six months. That's one reason. Number two, there's no end game here. What is exactly the end game? Is it Murphy? Because he's not being, you know, um, forgiven by the Mysterios, at least Ray and Dominic. So is that he's trying to use Aaliyah? I mean, that that would probably be the logical outcome. But for what, though? I mean, aside from the obvious, as people have brought up before, which would be even fucking worse, which would be disgusting, um, why else would he be using this this girl? Why? You know, it's not like he really has anything to, to gain from being in a relationship with a 19-year-old. And that brings me to my third reason. It's a 32-year-old in a relationship with a 19-year-old. Now, is that illegal? No. She's of legal consent. Realistically, she could do what she wants. I just think, as a storyline, it's fucking gross. Now, absolutely, I'm not stating that as a fact. It's a pure opinion. But I know by looking at my timeline, I'm not the only one who feels that way. This sucks. It's weird. It's uncomfortable. It's odd. I've seen people try to, like, justify it. And listen, if you like this stuff, that's fine. To me, it's fucking gross. I do not need to see a 19-year-old who barely just graduated high school, likely a year ago, making out with someone that could be, not her dad, but, you know, a couple years away from being her dad. The age difference is about almost 15 years. It's 13 years, but that's still weird. To me, I don't know. Age is merely a number. I realize that. If it's like a, maybe a 25-year-old with like a 38-year-old, maybe... Just because, you know, you're a grown adult by that point, whatever. If it's a 30 and a 43 year old, who fucking cares? Like, at that point, I don't really give a shit. You're, you're a fucking adult, you're whatever. She's an adult, too. By by law, she is an adult. She just graduated high school. That's fucking weird. That is weird. And you not you can't tell me otherwise. No one will change my mind on this. This is weird. It's stupid. It's a bad storyline. I don't know where it's going, nor do I really care. I don't even think they know. They're just continuing it for the sake of continuing it. So I thought this was terrible. Um, I just really have no desire to see this continue whatsoever. So back to the good stuff here on the show. We had the Street Profits taking on Shinsuke Nakamura and Cesaro in a, uh, in a good match. They actually had a really, really good match here, non-title match. Um, the SmackDown Tag Team Champions did emerge victorious. Now, my only nitpick here is that they gave this away randomly on a SmackDown. You can see this as a future feud. And yeah, they can always go back to it. But having the Profits beat Nakamura and Cesaro doesn't exactly make you want to see them feud if they've already the champions have already won. Now, the other part of me is happy that the Profits didn't lose because they've been booked so strongly as champions. It's actually refreshing to see champions win as often as they have. So that is cool. And Nakamura and Cesaro can always win a number one contenders match, I suppose. Um, and I know the Profits are being built up for a match of the pay-per-view, not Nakamura and Cesaro. I don't know. I just probably would have saved this for down the road because I thought this was good. But I enjoyed it for what it was. We then had Sasha Banks out, who was talking about her win at Hell in a Cell. Now, Sasha is not a babyface. Yeah, she got she got portrayed by Bailey. She is not a fucking babyface. She doesn't look like one. She doesn't act like one. She doesn't talk like one. And that's fine. But they need to book her as the boss coming out of this feud. She can be like the opposition of Bailey. You want to cheer Sasha more than Bailey, but not by much. She's not that much more redeemable than Bailey. But I think that might be by design. I might be giving them too much credit. I probably am, let's be honest. But I think they're doing this by design because once this rivalry runs it runs its course, and she is facing Asuka at the pay-per-view and she's a baby face, they might be doing this because once we reach TLC or whatever, she might transition into a feud with Bianca Belair or someone else. So I'm, I'm hoping that's the case. I mean, 
it feels like they have a lot of heels on SmackDown as it is, so they probably need Sasha as a face. But I don't know. If she's going to be a face, she has to switch up the character. And I like the heel boss character. I do, but as a baby face, it just doesn't work. She comes across as incredibly annoying in this role. Um, she's better than she was a couple of months ago, but again, not by much. So they got to do something drastic to change up the character if she is going to be a babyface. Because right now she's not likable at all. I'll be a slightly more likable than Bailey, but again, not by much. Because right now they have Sasha, technically still a heel, I guess. Bailey's a heel. Billy Kay's a heel. Natalia's a heel. Zelina Vega's a heel. They have Bianca's a babyface. Um, who else does SmackDown have? Tamina's a heel. They have a lot of heels on that show. A lot of fucking heels. They have the Riot Squad, and that's great. They don't really have much beyond those people. And even some of those people, I don't really care about. So, they need to turn one of these people face. It'll probably be Sasha, but currently, she does not feel like a face at all. So, the general gist of this segment was that Bailey challenged Sasha to a rematch. Because she acknowledged that we all know that you can win a title, Sasha. But we also know is that you can't hold on to it. Even you know that. You can't hold on to a championship to save your life. I think the longest title reign that Sasha has had on her own on the main roster, not including NXT or the tag title stuff, was 27 days. She has held the Raw Women's Championship five times. We poop on Charlotte all the time. But at least she's had title reigns that were longer than a month. I mean, that's ridiculous. Literally all five of Sasha's reigns have been have not exceeded the 27-day mark. Hopefully this one does. I mean, we're getting the rematch next week. That's what the whole point of this segment was, to set that up for next week. I wish they would have waited a little longer to do the rematch and not just two weeks out from the pay-per-view. I mean, you could have saved it for TLC, but I know they got, you know, Sasha and Asuka coming up. So I guess they want to tease that Bailey. You know, she's right. Bailey has beaten Asuka on her, I think. Has Bailey beaten Asuka on her own? No, I think Sasha helped her at, at SummerSlam. I don't remember, but Sasha definitely has not beaten Asuka without the help of Bailey. We do know that. So it doesn't really matter. I think Asuka's going to win either way. But yeah, so I hope Bailey doesn't win the belt back. I mean, then why take it off of her in the first place? It just further tells the story that she can't hold on to a championship. Like, what a loser. Before, it was like she could never win a championship on pay-per-view, and that finally stopped a couple of years ago. Um, but now, I mean, yeah, she can win the title on pay-per-view, but can she defend it on, on, on a pay-per-view? So far, that has not been the case. She's going to defend it next week on SmackDown, but the real key is when we get to TLC, if she can win there. Assuming she even gets that far as the champion. But I thought this was good otherwise. You know, short, sweet, straight to the point. Can't complain. So, finally, we get to the main event. Uh, one more men's Survivor Series qualifying match for Team SmackDown. Jey Uso taking on Daniel Bryan. A very good match here. And Jey Uso has pleasantly surprised me. As a singles competitor, I still think there is not much of a future for him beyond this Roman Reigns storyline. Once Jimmy comes back... Maybe they can go to different brands and really reinvent themselves and have good singles careers. I don't really... I, I like Jey Uso a lot. I don't see him going far at all on his own beyond the Roman stuff. I really don't. Especially if Jimmy's in the picture too. One of them would really have to change up their look or their character or, or whatever. And I just think they're better as a package deal. Especially at a time where tag team wrestling could really use them. And yeah, they've done everything as a tag team, but... There's some people that are just that that should be tag team competitors, and Jay and Jimmy are two of those people. Um, but he has done well on his own recently, though. He beat Daniel Bryan clean here. He beat AJ Styles clean a couple of weeks ago. He beat Daniel Bryan clean here too. So I thought that was kind of cool. But that wasn't all though. And I thought he might win with the help of Roman, but Roman actually never interfered at all. He stood at ringside for the match, but he never interfered. Jay did not cheat. He beat him clean as a sheet, which you absolutely know is a Daniel Bryan call. Brian literally just got done talking about this on Talking Smack a week or two ago, how he wants to help the younger talent. And he did that here. I put this out as a tweet last night, but look at the people that Daniel Bryan has elevated alone in the last year. Jay Uso with this win right here and the post-match attack because Jay Uso just went berserk. Roman, I guess, said to attack... I don't know, Jay seemingly willingly did it on his own. There was a clip on the WWE YouTube channel of Jay attacking Daniel Bryan after the bell, even when Roman wasn't there. So I don't want to call him a, like a straight-up heel just yet, but it certainly feels that way. So anyway, Jey Uso, he lost too clean here. He lost to Murphy, if you can remember that, on SmackDown. Clean, about a year ago, right after SummerSlam. He, he helped elevate Murphy before he didn't, because then Murphy just, he, he went nowhere after that. 
That was cool. He lost to Murphy. He lost to Mustafa Ali in a tag team match about a year and a half ago while he was the WWE champion. That was a pretty big fucking deal. Again, it went nowhere, but it was still cool. Um, so yeah, he lost to Mustafa Ali. He lost to Eric Rowan on a SmackDown last year after helping, you know, kind of make him relevant again in their tag team as the SmackDown Tag Team Champions. He helped elevate him. Um, and last fall, he lost to Kofi Kingston, of course, at WrestleMania 35. He's helped elevate a lot of people or helped, has helped put over a lot of people. Daniel Bryan, it, it can absolutely be said without a shadow of a doubt, one of the most selfless men in wrestling, which is cool. So yeah, Jay Uso wins. He's on Team SmackDown. I was not expecting that. I fully expected Brian to win. Good for Uso, though. I don't know what you do with Brian in the pay-per-view. Maybe he finds his way onto the team some other way. Maybe he beat Sammy for the championship, the Intercontinental title, before Survivor Series. Sammy was kind of promo on Bobby Lashley. I like Bobby. I like Sammy. I don't know. Maybe it was just their feud from two years ago that soured me on this idea of a match. You know, on the, on the idea of a match between the two at the pay-per-view coming up. Eh, I don't know. It's it's heel versus heel, so we'll see. But yeah, I'm just not overly optimistic. But anyway, um, yeah. So this was good. We have Jay Uso and we have Kevin Owens on Team SmackDown. As for the remaining three spots, I would imagine Alistair Black might get a spot. I could see Seth Rollins getting a spot, or Rey Mysterio, or Dominic, or something. So they really want to have trouble filling out the remaining spots. Um if you ask me. But I thought this was a good way to close out the show. Overall, just another very good episode. Again, the Rollins, Murphy, Aaliyah, Mysterio drama bullshit just is terrible. It's terrible, it's terrible, it's terrible. I cannot stress that enough. Other than that, though, you take that out, and this is an almost perfect show. Everything served the purpose. They set up Bailey and Sasha Banks for next week. They advertised Carmella's return, finally. Who really cares? But they set up her return for next week as well. We got a good tag team match. Profits, Nakamura, and Cesaro was good. Um, we had three qualifiers for Survivor Series, and all the, all the matches were good to great. The Corey Graves sit-down interview with Lars Sullivan was effective, and the Roman Reigns and Jey Uso stuff was compelling as always. So I really cannot give this anything but a thumbs up. I thought it was a very good show. A nice a nice way to kind of lead into the Halloween weekend, which is cool. I got some plans for later, so that's why I'm getting this out early. But uh, nonetheless, guys, be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Soon after this video goes up, I'm hoping to review slash put up the video for Talking Smack, the Halloween edition, going up today. That went up earlier today. So, um, lots to look forward to. i got to head out soon to go watch some Halloween movies and whatnot. Very excited for that and have some candy and whatnot. Uh, Going to be awesome. So, enjoy your Halloween, guys. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.